Hey guys, we're back again with some more Q&A. Uh, we've got another question or two that came from our recent webinar on avoiding deployment pitfalls of an ERRCS deployment that our very own Rob McCarthy uh, did along with Mike Altman from IBW Advisors. So um, another question we had come in was, what method would you recommend for uplink optimization testing? Das doctor, talk to me. Okay, well, probably the easiest, the easiest way to do uplink optimization testing, there, there's two pieces to this puzzle. The first is the actual DAS itself, right? I mean, we've got, we, we have to make the assumption that all of the numbers were right in the design, right? So assuming that we have our link budgets correct, which not all that doesn't always happen but assuming it does the first thing that and the easiest thing to do is take a portable or take a device that can simulate a portable if you can't get your hands on one generate the same amount of power the portable is going to generate into the closest electrical antenna into the system so if you uh hopefully all of your antennas are equally electrically equally spaced but you're going to have some minor variances there. So what you want to do is you want, you know, essentially to take a portable, stick it under an antenna, assuming they're all very close, get as close to the antenna as you would normally get and key that radio up, right? Get that radio transmitting and then measure the value of the signal going in to the uplink side of the BDA at that point or signal booster. Um, once you've got that measured, then you can find out if you have automatic gain control occurring, right? If you have AGC, automatic output level control, there's all kinds of different terms that they use for it. But, but the amplifier has to protect itself. And so what you're trying to do is you're trying to set the gain of the system at this point. And this should all be in design. When you go, when anybody goes and turns one of these systems up, if you don't have paperwork that says the estimated gain should be X and it's not within five or, you know, four or five dB of that, the people who did the design didn't do their job. But, but you go ahead and you key a portable or you generate a signal that's the same level as that portable, get as close to an antenna as you would in normal operation, check to make sure that you're your amplifier is not going into OLC or it is sitting right on the borderline of bouncing in and out of any kind of automatic gain control. Then you can, at that point, check for your maximum power output, depending on, you know, the type of amplifier it is, if it's channelized, if you're spreading the composite power over a multiple number of channels, you can confirm that your output power is as calculated. And then of course, you can then also follow it back. Many HJs now are actually measuring the power at the site. The amount of power arrives at the site. And you can, you can actually get that measurement from your HJ or who's ever the radio shop who's ever doing that. And you can, you can then say, all right, I know that my close portable, my near portable is, not, is driving the system to X and it's delivering, say, a minus 75 to the site. Now, the HJ may come back and say that's too much or too small, but, but at this point, you can use that number. And then you walk away from the antennas, right? And you walk away with the same portable and you look at the power drop to the minimum level that the HJ wants to see. And hopefully you don't get off into a corner where you drop to way below what it's supposed to be because that means you don't have enough indoor antennas and you, you never want to turn up the gain to accommodate for not enough antennas in the building. So uh, that's really the simplest way of doing it. And then of course, once you've got all that set up, then you go ahead and grid walk. You do your grid walk and you look at your downlink signals and you look at your uplink signals and, and do your testing. But, but it's really important to drive the amplifier to maximum power, walk away from your service antennas to drop to the minimum power, make sure that those two levels deliver a minimum and maximum signal to the site that's acceptable to the HJ. For instance, in, in uh, Washington State, minus 75 to minus 95, you have a 20 dB window. That means your indoor antennas have to be separated only by 20 dB or so. And and then once you've done that, then you can go and do your your setup and uh, or do your your testing and walk away from it. 
Um, but but those are the you know easiest way the easiest way to test your uplink to make sure everything's working right. Of course, you've got your uplink noise power, which the FCC limits to minus 43 dBm. Uh, making sure that that is not exceeded is an important thing. So you know, making sure those rules are are within tolerance and out of band emissions at minus 70 dBm or less. All right, starting to get a little bit confusing for me, but I'm getting what you're picking up for sure, or picking up <laughs> what you're putting down. <laughs> but so, so quick question though. So the equipment, the piece of equipment that you have, um, you know, the, the radio itself, when you're walking away, um, that'll tell you what DB level you're at. And it, as you walk away, you'll, you'll watch that go down. Yeah. I mean, the, the actual radio, no, I'm talking, well, I'm talking about, you have a person at the BDA, right at the actual BDA and he, he or she has test equipment connected to the BDA, watching the signal that's being generated from the portable there. Okay. And, and you want to make sure that Why? your BDA does not go into any kind of sa self-sacrificing mode, uh, OLC, no matter where they are yeah. on the floor. Now, obviously, if somebody is able to get up and touch an antenna with the portable, then you've got, you've got to deal with those right. type of uh, situations, you know, individually but for the most part antennas should be you know right. 10 foot away from the radio right as you're walking through radio on your belt or on your hip um, you know hopefully you've got 10 foot of separation between the radio and the antenna at any given point you know in the system yeah typically the right. ceiling even that tall almost right so um right okay so i get it so basically you got the piece of equipment on the one end tell your guy hey start walking Let's see what happens and you can look at the equipment okay it's not going to take over that automatic function which means that you haven't designed it properly if it's automatically right happening well to i mean itself. that's essentially if you if your amplifier has to go into an automatic level control in other words it's maximizing its power and it has to reduce it because your portable is getting too close to an antenna that's a design flaw yeah. now some will disagree with that yeah. but that's that's where the biggest problems occur when we have issues with uh, what they what people try to do is use too few antennas so that you can walk 300 foot away from the antenna and the amplifier still does full power and then as you walk closer you get to a point where the you know as you get closer and closer and the amplifier is actually shutting itself down as you're getting closer to the antenna because it's only the FCC only allows a maximum amount of power and so it has to uh, they have to be designed that way in order to be certified by the FCC. So uplink optimization testing is essentially using a portable or something to mimic it. Uh, ideally, you'd have a portable like would be utilized in that jurisdiction, getting it to the maximum power it's going to experience through, or it's going to put through an antenna and the minimum essentially, and right. making sure that at both of those levels, you are still getting an acceptable signal level back at the, the, the donor site. And that the BDA is not going into any kind of protective mode when it when when it's like gets too close to an antenna. You don't want the BDA to go into AGC. Or, Understood. So 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 real quick, I want to actually squeeze in another question here because I think this this might uh, cross over a little bit. Um, there was another one that, that was about what are some practical ways the FCC license holder of the public safety frequencies can define and or set standards for that could mitigate some of the problems that are typically facing installed systems. So I think it has to do with, you were kind of hitting on it a little bit with uh, like what, what Washington state is doing, which is to set certain levels that are acceptable um, uh, for the uplink um, signal back at the donor site, right? Is that an example of one, one uh, standard that can be set by a license holder to, to make sure that these systems are getting tested and approved at the right, the right uh, specifications? Yeah, I think the first one is follow the FCC rules. I mean, I know that there's folks that sit there and say, well, the FCC rules are a suggestion. They're not a suggestion. You know, follow them. If you follow the noise rules, we there's a group, a large group, that back in 2010, we went through this whole process to design a set of rules that would essentially protect what's going on from going on. Uh, a best practices, if you will. And they're they're already within the FCC rules. So it's not like you have to go look for them. But the other thing that an HJ can do or a licensee can do to protect his system uh, is the FCC rules, when, when we wrote them, 
We assumed that BDAs would not really ever be used any closer than about two miles from a site. You know, I mean that you weren't going to be using them. And and the reality is that with some of these lead, uh, you know, lead certified buildings and some of the new glass, we're starting to see these things get these amplifiers be installed. You know, maybe even up to half a mile away from a site. Uh, if you're more, if you're closer than half a mile, you're run, really on a razor blade blade edge. But the licensee can also reduce the gain levels and the power levels as you get closer to a site. So if they've got a site that say you you got a a donor site that's half a mile away, uh, HJ should reduce the maximum level of gain that's allowed. Plus the are you falling asleep there, guys? On me, that's really no. Cool. No, well, I'm, I'm no, no, no. What you're saying, <laughs> no, no, no Kenny, your 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 face I'm... froze. You 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 stopped. Your the video stopped on this side. Go, what's going on? Anyway, <laughs> um, but a licensee can actually, uh, for instance, in Sacramento, they talk about when you get closer to a donor site, they're they are going to require that you reduce the gain level and the power level of your equipment. Your, your signal booster equipment. And, and that's, that's very helpful too. Um, but I still, I, I still caution anybody that's using a BDA closer than half a mile to a donor site to be very, very, very careful because you can, you can end up with a lot of, of noise problems, even if you follow the FCC rules. Well, and I think another good point, right, is, um, you know, I think uh, some of these license holders haven't um, actively engaged in the past when it came to BDA employment deployments. And I think that that's that's one point that's that's important, um, you know, per the FCC rules, uh, you have to have the permission of the license holder in order to, to deploy a signal booster or BDA. Right. So. Um, making sure that they're enforcing those rules, making sure they're engaging when maybe the fire code is stating, hey, we need a, a solution deployed here and BDA is being proposed. They need to be involved in those discussions. They need to make sure that these systems aren't going in without their express written approval, right? So um, yeah, they, they also, need engagement without a doubt. Yeah, they need to be, They uh, the licensee needs to be involved because there may be other solutions that are better solutions than just throwing a BDA in. So, I, I mean, and I'm not, saying that BDAs don't serve a purpose. They do. Signal boosters serve a purpose when they're used according to the law and they're used in the proper environment. Um, and, uh, you know, li unfortunately, the licensee in this situation is somewhat um, responsible, if you will, for making sure that the BDAs are used legally uh, because sometimes the fire code, I mean, the fire code is, I, I won't say the so sometimes the way the fire code is being enforced puts signal boosters in places where they're not legally authorized. Let's just put it that way. Yeah, it's important to tie together all the stakeholders that are involved. And when you're, um, you know, rebroadcasting someone's spectrum that's licensed to them through a government entity, right? Then obviously they're one of the stakeholders that needs to be involved in that discussion. So that's correct. Absolutely. Well, I think that's about all we have time for uh, for this session, guys. I appreciate both of you, Jesse, and you, the DAS doctor, Greg Glenn. Um, for anybody that's, uh, that's, that's got more questions, don't hesitate to reach out to us and also subscribe to our YouTube channel so you make sure you get notifications. Uh, we'll, we'll be continuing to release more question and answer sessions so we can continue to spread our knowledge and be gracious and authentic with our expertise. So uh, thank you to everybody that, that's watching. Make sure you subscribe and we'll, we'll be back soon. Thanks. Thanks, guys.